Japan has not been one to shy away from controversial films, but few have garnered such international acclaim such as Battle Royale, a film which is difficult to talk about without this being shoved down your throat. But to a certain degree, this film also had an influence on that. Making something controversial is easy. Making something that's controversial with meaning and that's actually good, that takes a little bit of skill. By today's standards, Battle Royale may seem tame due to the media that have followed in its footsteps, but it was Battle Royale which left such a timeless legacy that opened all those doors. It was a difficult journey to get this film out there, given its content. This of course all originates back to the novel that it's based on. In this video, we'll be dissecting the film adaptation, the original novel that inspired it, and looking at the legacy that Battle Royale left behind. The novel was written in 1996, but would not be officially published until 1999. Let that go ahead and sink in. The original concept from what I would say was a sleep paralysis dream, as stated by author Koshun Takami. Takami at the time was a journalist. In a half-asleep state, he dreamt of being in a classroom. There was a teacher he had seen from a J-drama beforehand who spoke to the class, stating, all right, class, listen up. Today, I'm going to have you all kill each other. He told the dream to his friends who thought it sounded much like the premise for a battle royale you would see in pro wrestling. Thus, he began to form a story around such an idea. The novel is a dystopian story set in an alternate Japan, which is in a fascist totalitarian state known as the Republic of Greater East Asia. The novel gives us more information about the world and the government than the film does, but it's still pretty paper thin. The book doesn't spend a lot of focus on the world building because its attention is on the characters. The environment is pivotal to these characters' situations and we're given exactly what we're needed. And we are left with plenty for our imagination to run rampant with. Never forget, sometimes less is better. The dystopian world is very Big Brother-ish with many heavy political themes that we'll dissect a little bit more as we get into it. This government put a major ban on things like rock and roll, any decent films, and literature. The book tells us that America is known as the American Empire, which could be literal or could just be how that particular Japan views America. Although if such music and media exist to be banned, we can assume it's the latter. We do learn that this whole government is the result of an alternate result of World War II. Much of the dystopia world was built from Takami's real life experiences growing up. In the late 1960s, there was a worldwide wave of protests sprung from anti-war and civil rights activists. In Japan, at the same time, there were student protests against universities that caused many to be shut down. These protests were for many reforms, but it commonly originated from student disapproval of corrupt board of directors. That and a simple combating against conservative traditions. And the protests did end up turning violent. It's evident how these rebellions against police brutality played a major role in the world building for Battle Royale. Takami is also attributed The Long Walk, a Stephen King story as inspiration. The story also focuses on a grueling game set by a totalitarian government. Stephen King has openly praised Battle Royale, and when it came to the similarities of the work, King simply said, no prob. As I stated, the core of the story is the characters. It's something the book does phenomenally well. The chapters drift from different characters giving us different perspectives. We know who the main characters are, and we're more focused on their story, but it doesn't prevent the book from making us care about the others. This is a story about a fascist government that made a game called the Number 68 Program. This program randomly selects a class of third years from junior high. That makes most of the victims around 15 years old. This class is taken away to a remote setting where they must participate in a battle royale. I'm sure you know what that means, but yes, the classmates are forced to kill each other until the last person standing. This is not an event that happens once a year. It happens multiple times a year, although I'm not entirely sure the math in the book really checks out. The government excuses the game as a means of research, but the reality is 
that it's a fear tactic. One to keep the people in check and to avoid any rebellion. The novel puts its focus on one such unfortunate class placed into the program. Although the game consists of 42 students at the beginning, it does have a protagonist, Shuya. Shuya is a rebellious rock-loving jock who just happens to be fit and with all the necessary survival skills. During the game, he tries to protect Noriko, the crush of his best friend, together with the help of a new transfer student, Kawada. The novel's first draft was completed in 1996, but it was ultimately rejected for its controversial content. It is speculated that this was not just because of the content of the novel, but also due to an incident the prior year, the Kobe child murders, in which a 14-year-old boy killed two other children in rather gruesome means. A lot of people have discussed these murders before, and it's a very disturbing and fascinating crime, but a note I would like to add. A letter was sent to the media claiming to be the murderer, which opened with the phrase, now, it's the beginning of the game. Yeah, that's pretty rough timing. Battle Royale was finally published in 1999. It was a surprising success, eventually selling over a million copies. Critics praised it, and there was no doubt that the story would eventually be turned into a film. There were two major adaptations of the novel. One is a manga, which, while is pretty close to the original story, is very anime and exaggerated. It takes away a lot of the horror aspects of the story, but leaves much else intact. But what we're all here for is the film. Battle Royale went through an interesting production. The film was directed by Kinji Fukusaku, one of the most innovative directors of Japanese cinema. He is most famously known for his works in the crime genre, particularly Yakuza Ega. His films excelled at expressing political and social criticisms through violent and gritty pictures. His early works came at the tail end of Japan's post-war cinema era, much of the films still working on those same ideologies. He is most commonly cited as opening the Japanese New Wave movement. I think understanding Fukusaku will help enlighten the film. Fukusaku as a child was drafted to labor as a munitions worker during the Second World War. He was only 15 years old. After a bombing, he witnessed the death of many other children, corpses that had to be disposed by the survivors. It was at this point that he began to develop a hatred for adults and became disillusioned to the government's lies. It was Fukusaku's own childhood that attracted him to making the film adaptation for Battle Royale. The 1980s saw a true economic surplus, think of it like the Roaring Twenties for the US. But of course, the bubble would pop, making the 90s a much darker and grittier era of economic recession. The generation growing up in this time was losing faith in their elders and was seeing a generation of adolescent angst and hatred of their education system. Fukusaku saw and understood all this and reflected it in his works. The screenplay for Battle Royale would be written by Fukusaku's son, Kinta, another filmmaker. Battle Royale would also be Kenji's final full film, as he did film one scene of the sequel before passing away. Around 6,000 actors would audition for the film. Many of the cast that made the cut were older than the age of the characters, with only four of the cast actually being 15 at the time. Those who were still teens include Aki Maeda, who portrays Noriko, Yukihiro Kutani, who plays Nobu, Takayo Mimura, who plays Kayako, and Yukari Kanasawa, who plays Kitano. Not that Kitano. 
Whereas Taro Yamamoto, who played Kawada, was already 25 at the time. I'll discuss it more towards the end of the video, but there were a lot of stars who got their start in this film. Takeshi Kitano was casted as the villainous teacher role. He was already a well-established actor, popular internationally. Furthermore, he was known for his role as a game show host, which added an extra layer to his role in the film, and brought a strong sense of realism to his portrayal. That makes his character even more frightening. <laughs> The film was released in December 2000, made on a budget of only 4.5 million. Although the film is very controversial and handles adult themes, Fukasaku failed to get the rating he wanted, being that he was 15 when he witnessed his horrors and wanted to share that with the youth and his message of the film. Of course, the government wasn't prone to this idea. Members of the Diet thought that the film was too dangerous for the minds of the youth. They saw the film as crude, to which Fukasaku said that their bias blinded them from seeing the point of the film and he did not try to fight it further as he feared it would cause more regulations on his film. He did, however, openly encourage young viewers to sneak into the movie. What a badass. The government was really afraid of this movie. They would use it as an excuse for teen crime. There were anxieties that this film would have a Clockwork Orange effect. For those who don't know, Clockwork Orange is an incredibly controversial film from the 70s, also based on a book, with focus on youth gangs. The film was blamed for many crimes after its release and blamed for having a negative effect on the British youth. Incredible the power that films hold, isn't it? As for outside of Japan, it was just as difficult to find a distributor. The US was scorned after the horrific Columbine shootings and thus felt negative responses to Battle Royale. Many saw it as nothing but mindless violence. Years later, a revived interest tried to bring the film to theaters, but struggled to get through the MPAA ratings. Toei was advised to not cave in, as cutting down the film to their standards would jeopardize the powerful themes of the movie. It wouldn't be until 2011, over 10 years later, that the film would finally be released in North American theaters. Anchor Bay would finally release the film in a set which includes the theatrical, special edition, and the sequel. Oh yeah, there's a special edition. This video will focus on the special edition as it's really the ideal way to view the film. Though it's not a major game changer. The main difference are with additional scenes that will break away in the film review. Battle Royale! The film opens with an exciting opening crawl that will forever change how you view Requiem Dies Irae. The opening gives the audience more perspective on the world than the novel does in the beginning, prepping them for this alternate Japan and showing them a victor of the previous battle royale, one of the most famous images of modern film. The scene was in the book, but it happened at a different time, as it was viewed via the orphanage television by a very young Shuya and Nobu, with no awareness of the program. Their caretaker comforts them, telling them that the girl won a very bad lottery, and their odds of ever being involved in such an event are very slim. The film makes major changes to Shuya's background. In the novel, his parents died or ran away while he was very young, and he grew up in a religious orphanage with Nobu. They grew up together like brothers. In the film, we see Shuya not much older than the main timeline, witnessing his father's corpse after committing suicide. 
and his father leaves him with a message of encouragement as his final act. His father's death could be reflective of the high suicide rates that Japan saw in the late 1990s due to the economic distress. This is unfortunately a cold reality that Japan has been fighting against. The film then gives us a glimpse of the teenage rebellion against the education system, with students bullying their teacher Katano. Now, the film does put major emphasis on the military influence to the educational systems in this world, although it feels a bit contradictory to the book. We get a lot more glimpses to the school life in the novel, where it seems unlikely that the students would pull off such a violent act. Shuya got to be a star athlete and befriend Shinji. He helps to protect some of the less popular students from bullies. Not by violence, but by rather intelligent means. Such as with the student Akamatsu. One who was being bullied for his, lack of a better word, nerdy hobbies and weight. He was being assaulted by some other rude students, in which Shuya encourages the entire class to defend Akamatsu in a rather adorable manner. This is a major advantage that the novel does hold over the film. We are able to have more time with the students and to understand them more intimately. There are many moments that happen exactly but don't hold quite as much emotional weight to the viewer. Mind you, the novel doesn't play out like some school J drama in the beginning. All of this information comes in flashbacks when necessary to the characters whose perspectives we are following at that moment. Needless to say, this is a pretty big change that makes the students seem even more like delinquents in the film. Given the slight change to the world in this film, it's not bad by any means. Even more so, it's incredibly effective. It does give us an early introduction to the Noriko and Kitano dynamic and opens a more sympathetic look at Kitano. I did find it very, very strange that Nobu was the one to stab Kitano. That's very odd and out of character for him. Nobu was the type of person who would only get mad when it came to defending someone else, such as when his dog was killed in a hit and run, or when he discovered that his caretaker, who raised him, was sexually assaulted by their teacher in the novel named Kimpatsu. The special edition extended this basketball scene and used it as a framework for the film, making sporadic appearances. The scene illustrates Shinji and Shuya's athleticism, as well as showing the overall bond and connections that the students hold for each other. We can see how supportive they are for this community amongst themselves and the new teacher who is so much more invested with his students. We can also see Mitsuko's alienation from the rest of the class. We can see her longing to be a part of this, but her anxiety just won't let her. This is where the story actually begins. It's cold, abrupt, and real. In the novel, it's just as if Shuya had awakened from a daydream and snapped back into reality in the seat of his bus. The scene builds tension with the militant presence and their teacher's anxiety. Here, the novel would spend a good bit of time expanding on the students on the bus, giving us a general understanding of the characters and attitudes. Of course, this is a film, so we have to streamline things more fluidly. There are nice details here we can look at, though. For example, pay attention to the other girls' reactions as they watch Noriko offer Shuya cookies. Notes of jealousy as she talks to the star of the class. Or we could see Mitsuko sleeping alienated from all the others. Of course, we just get this overall general positive atmosphere. We can tell that these students care for one another, but we'll see how long that actually lasts. I wonder if anyone still has this photo. I do wish that they could have included the detail of Kawada realizing that they're being gassed and trying to break the window open. Unfortunately, Kawada and Kiriyama are introduced a bit later. It's also interesting that Shuya didn't even check on Nobu when he woke up. Notice that his first instinct was to look for the teacher, their supervisor and expected guardian. Then he makes his approach to Noriko. The cinematography here is impeccable. The timing of the camera as well as the line of its movement so beautifully illustrates Shuya's disorientation 
and slow realization of the situation. The layout of the classroom seems interesting here. It's very disorganized with students just laid on the ground. There are some chairs and a couple desks. It seems as if the military just put them there without a care versus the novel, where they were placed in a layout that was almost identical to their home room. They were even seated exactly as they would be in their class. I think I find the latter just a little bit more disturbing, but it does show these different approaches of the government for these worlds. The novel, the government is very brutal, but they still care about their appearance and they want to keep this nice and tidy world where everything follows a straight line with a proper posture. Here it's a bit more muddied and even chaotic. Great introductions though, and take note, this this right here, this is how you film dark scenes. The lighting here is so good. The collars also serve as a weapon within the story, but are symbolic for the government's hold on the children as well. Not just the children, but all of those forced under their control. This is perhaps a good time to discuss the teacher role. In all three versions of Battle Royale, the teacher is different. In the original, he's a creep who likes to hold a fake smile and a cheery attitude. With his opening lines, Today, you're all going to kill each other, as if it was just another school morning plan. He is a rapist, as before mentioned, as well as informing the students that many of their parents were killed for going against the government. And he just explains it so matter-of-factly, as if they deserve to die and the students should not be concerned. He raped Shuya and Nobu's caretaker, which provokes Nobu to verbally threaten Kimpatsu, leading to his death. Kimpatsu has no previous ties to the class, and has no personal vendettas, but still greatly enjoys watching them kill each other. He even gambles on the victor. His approach is more sadistic, making all the students write on paper that they will kill their friends, and even throws a knife at one of the students' skulls for whispering, which we do see that in the film, and threatens to kill Noriko after she's been injured since she's at a disadvantage. The manga version is very close to the novel. Take for example a scene where Megumi tries to call her parents. In the book, Kimpatsu playfully reminds her that phones will not work, and loudly tells her that her phone could be a risk, which he was right about. The manga version is, um, more unsettling. Katano is far less sadistic, but actually is far more sympathetic. Katano not only struggles to connect with the students, but within his own family as well. We can see that his own daughter despises him, which adds to his connection with Noriko. It's evident that she's nicer to him, more so than anyone else in the film, and I'm sure he can't help but wish that she was his own daughter instead. Which fuels his desire for her to be the victor, seeing her as hope for this new generation. A kid who isn't just some juvenile delinquent. That said, he still has no problem killing off these kids. He probably cares more about them than the previous iterations, but still. What I found most striking about his performance was how calm he is. In the novel, or the manga, the characters are very exaggerated and animated. Here, it's real. As before mentioned, being a famous face as a game show host, I'm sure added to many Japanese viewers and international viewers who watched his castle show, but even more than that, he's just so down to earth. Given Fukusaku's background, he did a damn good job to not just show the adults as simple antagonists to the youth. He really understood the complex nature of the generational gaps and brought it to a higher level of reality than the novel. The film shows us rebellious teens who seem to dominate the poor teacher, but then the film reminds us who really is in control of this world. But even with that power, Katano is still a tragic character who struggles to connect with anyone. The consequence of 
Kitano being such a great character is that Nobu isn't really much of a character at all. Notice what Kitano says here. He describes the previous teacher being a failure of an adult. A rather ironic take, given that this teacher has done everything correct. He is shown to care for his students. He wanted to protect them like a teacher should, which resulted in his death. Whereas, we could say Kitano is the failure. He failed to connect with the students and his own family. There's a lot to unpack with Kitano's speech. The obvious, you don't respect your elders point, but also that life is a game. A game for survival. These lines are altered for the film, but I can't help but feel like Fukusaku really wanted those lines to burn into the young viewer's minds. I cannot believe that this is Yuko Miyamura, the voice actress of Asuka in Evangelion. I would almost say that the training video was a bit of Jingling Keys approach to explaining the game, but it's also really entertaining. The first two deaths are interesting opposites here. Fujiyoshi is killed in such a quick manner. The film gives it a bit more of a sparkle though, causing the class to have this little bit of an outburst, which gives us an early showcase of the chaos to ensue once they're all let out. Whereas in the book, it just kind of happens and the students have no choice but to stay still out of fear that it'll happen to them as well. They can't really have this outburst because they already have all these guns pointed at them not to mention they're just literally scared stiff. And then Nobu gets a whole budget explosion on his neck. It doesn't really hold as much emotion as the novel. Again, he really isn't a character in this one, but we do feel sad for Shuya. It all adds to the unapologetic nature of this world. And just a reminder, these are children. And now the rest are thrown into the game. I love the detail of Kawada's readiness. It gives us all the implication to know that this is someone with experience and resourceful. He isn't overly phased by Katano's speech, nor has he shown fear to the situation. He's just trying to tie his shoes. Safety first. A trip on your laces could mean death after all. Kiriyama, on the other hand, is suspicious, menacing, and far too calm for the situation. Someone who would walk around with their hands in their pockets in this world is the scariest son of a bitch I can think of. Kiriyama could be the best or the worst part of the novel depending how you look at it. The film doesn't give us a lot to work with, he's just a random transfer student that got thrown in, most likely to stir the pot. Kawada even speculates if Kiriyama willfully joined for fun. Someone who kills for the sake of killing and revels in the game. He is the biggest threat as he doesn't play for personal survival, but for sport. We don't get any insight on his life. Did he have a hard upbringing that led him to be this way, or is he just an unhinged psychopath? Even the most dangerous of students give us something to latch onto to see them as human, not Kiriyama. The viewer would question, is he really just a monster? In the book, we do get more understanding for him, but again, it may be a bit too animated, hence removing it from the film. In the book, he is not a transfer student. He is a classmate that leads the gang of delinquents. Punks with some honor, if you will. He is very much still stoic, though. He suffered from a brain injury and from a car accident while still in his mother's womb. This cost him human emotions. In turn, however, he is a genius, one who can master anything he picks up at an astonishing rate, but would grow bored of it and move on to the next thing. His biggest fan and closest ally, Numai, remarked that not once had he ever smiled. He even saved Numai from a group of bullies, but not out of kindness, but because they were too loud. He is not one to shy away from bringing harm to others, for his own gain. When the game begins, he had a choice to make. He knew how to defeat Kenpatsu and the army and how everyone could escape. Or he could play the game and he put all of that on a coin toss. The winning side, obvious. I realize it's pretty cartoony, 
but there is a lot of potential to make that a very, very cold scene. Again, this novel does have its anime-esque moments, which the manga took to the next level, and the film masterfully brings everything back to reality, making it a more believable story. The film made Tendo's death more haunting. Instead of just finding her already dead corpse, she walks several paces in a state of disbelief before killing over. One of the most popular studies over this film is how the game affects the players. Psychoanalytical studies to understand how each player's previous conditions shape how they react in the game. The first to kill is Akamatsu, a larger student who is rather timid and nerdy. I mentioned before how Shuya helped defend him from bullies back at school. None of that really given to us here in the film, but we can infer that he is playing for fear of his own life. In his mind, everyone will see him as the weakest player and try to take him out because they believe he is an easy target. The film shows us how timid he is. No! <laughs> Kazushi even asks if the weapon belongs to Akamatsu and probably was going to give it back to him. But Akamatsu in his frightened state thinks Kazushi will kill him and thus his fear is forced into reality. Keep in mind, Akamatsu started killing people immediately after the game started. There was no wait. He was just ready to pick players off as soon as they left the doors. Honestly, in terms of survival, perhaps not a, an awful strategy if you can pull it off which Akamatsu couldn't. Still, Akamatsu is a victim to his own fear, a fear conditioned by his life of bullying and insecurities that the game victimized. The weapons here are a bit different. In the novel, Shuya got a knife and Noriko cut a boomerang. Noriko and Shuya do have an interesting dynamic. Shuya originally wasn't supposed to be an optimistic guy. In the words of Takami, the author, I originally created a hot-tempered character who would fit in technically, but in the end I think his optimistic and naive character is more appropriate. We face numerous trials in our daily lives, but even when it looks completely hopeless, we shouldn't make the mistake of simply saying, the end. One who always has hope can be called optimistic, but in emergencies or other times of tribulation, hope becomes essential. I've seen many complain that Shuya is an idiot, but again, I must remind you, he is 15 years old and that he has a deep connection with these students, his peers. He plays sports with them, he goes to class with them, sees them practically every day. And in this version, he's also still struggling with the loss of his father. So we can infer that those connections are incredibly important for him right now. And Noriko, the smartest character in the whole story voices her realistic worries. The biggest question of the entire story. We know these students in class, and we share plenty of time with them at school. But do we really know what's in their heart? Do we know who they are by themselves behind closed doors? Are they really the type to play this game? The type who could kill their other classmates? Optimism is good and a great trait for Shuya to have, but Noriko keeps reeling him back to reality. Not in a cynical, all hope is lost manner, but one that states that they need to be cautious in this game. Because there are sketchy people who can turn. Look at Akamatsu, a sweet guy who wouldn't even hurt a fly, snapped almost instantly and took the first lives of the game. The film added a layer of Noriko being a victim to bullying, which I really don't think was entirely necessary. She really could have just said these lines without the added layer, and we'd believe her. The film does give more implications that Shuya also likes Noriko, but the main focus is to understand why protecting her means so much to Shuya. He's not just protecting her for himself, or because he likes her, but because she's the girl who his best friend, his brother, loved. And now he's gone. Shuya feels that this is all he can do for Nobu. I like the details in this room as well. Shuya playing guitar, which was a major part of his character in the novel, 
that the movie doesn't really dwell on. And look at all the manga by Nobu's bed. There's kind of a contrast here between hobbies of these characters. And although it is strange that Nobu is the one to teach Shuya how to play guitar in this version. Again, this movie did a lot of weird things with Nobu. Notice that Shuya is still wearing his best friend's blood on his clothes. Speaking of Nodoko, pay attention to Kitano. He seems to eat a cookie to signify every time his student dies and refuses to share them. Kiriyama killing the Mai's gang would be the equivalent of the coin toss scene. It is a pretty effective way to show how fearful we should be of the villain. One showing no signs of fear or concern even when multiple guns are aimed at him and no worthwhile weapon in his bag. Notice how he smiles every tap he gets with the fan. What's really fascinating here is that Numai states that no one is killing anyone here. And while these are supposed to be the delinquent gang, are we to believe that they had no intention of playing the game? Perhaps they were planning some rebellion against Katano. I'm pretty sure her death is used for the poster that we see in Shaun of the Dead. Sakura and her boyfriend's suicide is almost exact, although we don't learn that extra layer that her father was killed by the government, murdered right in front of her young eyes, which adds to her desire not to play the game or cave to the government. Death is an escape. But even without that extra layer here, the writing here is good and we get the point. I would say that this is creepy, but then again, given the situation, it's normal to look for comfort. Mitsuko is a tragic character, a complete polar opposite of Kiriyama who kills for fun. Mitsuko is someone we can at least be sympathetic for. Her life is actual hell and has conditioned her as such. The special edition adds additional scenes of Mitsuko's past, which is enough for me to tell you, yes, that is the definitive edition of the film. When Mitsuko was a child, her mother sold her to a pedophile. She kills the man in self-defense, and you can imagine how that would change a person, especially a child. She grew up beautiful and used that to her advantage. She shows signs of social anxiety and alienation, but she knew how to deceive others and how to use her looks to her advantage. For example, we can see how she killed several boys engaging in sexual acts. Because of her social status, she isn't looked on very favorably by her peers. A major example is the fact that everyone addresses her by her first name. Which in Japan, you only do that with very close friends. Here it's the opposite case. She does well to make herself difficult to get along with by putting up a heavy wall between herself and others. The only friend we can assume she had, she slept with their boyfriend. Her alienated state doesn't make it difficult for her to decide to play the game. Personal survival is her top priority, and she has no strong attachments to anyone to care about. The novel, her childhood is even more tough. When she was a child, her mother sold her to a group of men who sexually assaulted her and recorded it. I believe she was nine years old. Mitsuko went to her teacher for help, who also sexually assaulted her. So we can understand the difficulty here of trusting adults. Mitsuko's friends saw the rape and started spreading rumors which tainted her reputation. Her mother attempted to sell her again, but then she killed her own mother in self-defense. She was then moved to live with some other distant family members who were abusive to her, including the male of the household who, well, you can assume the rest. So yeah, her life was awful, and it created the person that we see here. Mitsuko, I believe, is reflective of Japanese female delinquency, considering her involvement with drugs and prostitution. It's incredible that Kentano reads the names of all their dead classmates, Misko is just focused on getting her makeup ready for the next day. The fight with Oki is more random in the film. It's a pretty good move on the film's part though I will say. The novel had Shuya and Oki stare each other down like a western. Shuya, ever so slightly, went to his knife which provoked Oki to attack him. The end result being the same. The fight was a bit more stretched out however. Oki's hatchet cuts through Shuya's earlobe which provokes his mind to make a joke about wanting to pierce his ears anyway. 
I always like those quick moments of humor in a literal life or death situation. It feels like something that my own mind would do to keep myself calm. The film is just a surprise attack. We don't know much about Oki, but considering earlier in the film when he fumbled to grab the bag, we can infer that he's either incredibly frightened or just really clumsy, either one resulting in his death. After the hatchet enters his skull, he is snapped back into sanity, apologizing to Shuya. So we can assume he wasn't doing this out of pure malice, but because he was terrified. Unlikely that he was actually playing the game, but just trying to survive, much like Akamatsu. Shuya's reaction to the death is a bit more fast-paced and immediate. There's a rather sweet moment where he begins to hyperventilate and Noriko calms him down. But here he's just freaking out and needed immediate reassurance that he didn't kill Oki. Regardless if he did or not, it was clearly self-defense, but that's the type of person that Shuya is. Immediately after, the two are attacked by Kyochi, who thankfully has awful aim. There isn't any major difference here outside of toning down the gore. Kyochi is actually the only student who is to be dismembered in the game. Kawada blasts his arm off with a shotgun, which in his crazed state, tries to retrieve the gun from his arm. In the film, Kawada doesn't give him any warnings, as he does in the book, but ultimately just puts him down, as his mind is far too gone now. The film gives an additional layer of having him more obsessive with repeating his desire to keep good grades and get into a good school after graduation. His mind latches to what has been his motivations in life as a reasoning to play the game. Study hard, play hard, get into a good school, Success. Koichi is also the student who said that his father got into a good position in the government and that they shouldn't be in the game. But Kampatsu reminds him that everyone is equal in the eyes of the government and that there are no special privileges. In the film, he asks Kitano if he can go home once the game is over, which Kitano replies, if you win by killing everyone else. Koichi took that to heart. And those were probably the last words that he clung on to. This brings us to Kawada, arguably one of the most interesting characters. Kawada was still a relatively new student in the book, being a year older than his peers, but he was held back. He was well built, covered in scars, and intimidating to everyone, so they kept their distance from him. But you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Kawada looks intense, but is one of the most important allies to Shuya and Noriko. He actually gives them a lot of information on the government with his own philosophies and distrust birthed from the government killing his own father and putting him in the game. Kawada is a survivor of the program and with the worst luck on the planet ended up in it again. In the previous game all he cared about was protecting his girlfriend who unfortunately died. He then had to kill some of his classmates to survive. We can see his readiness compared to the other students. Someone with this experience does have the advantage. He's already overcome the mental hurdles of having to kill his classmates and is prepared to do what's necessary to survive. But he's not evil. He kills when provoked, but does not hunt down students like Mitsuko or Kiriyama. Seeing how determined Shuya is to protect Noriko reminds him of his previous game with his own girlfriend, Keiko, and finds redemption in helping those two. The film makes their connection take a bit longer to form, as they skip some scenes to keep the narrative's rhythm by going straight into the megaphone scene with Yumiko and Yukiko. Watching the film, we would see these two as tragic fools with good intentions. They wholeheartedly believe that their class didn't want to fight. The novel gives us a bit more insight to their connections with the class and makes it a bit more understanding, but as a viewer, just of the film, we'd probably see them as idiots. They have the morally right idea, but where do those morals get you in this game? You become easy targets. And Kiriyama is far more sadistic here, using the megaphone to project the girl's dying moans. I don't really like how they made Shuya act like an idiot in this scene either. The reason Kawada fires his gun is to scare the girls off, to warn them, to save them. Shuya understood that in the book, but since they haven't had that chance to connect here, he just ignores the fact that Kawada is trying to save all of their lives and acts like an asshole. Kitano's message breaks are interesting. The previous teachers take a lot of enjoyment in announcing the students' deaths and even makes jokes about it. Kitano, while still being humorous, is still acting like a teacher. 
saying things like make sure you take a break and eat before fighting some more. He doesn't really make jokes about the students' deaths either, illustrating his complex relationship with them. Maybe the quirk about making peace, but there's actually a lot of truth to what he says. You can't trust everyone in this game. This film did kill off Yoji and Yoshimi pretty easily, but making them another couple that committed suicide. In the novel, Mitsuko kills them as they have a lover's spat, during which we learn more about Mitsuko's less than legal antics and how Yoshimi regretted falling into that crowd. She thought she could find redemption in Yoji, but unfortunately they both found their end by Mitsuko. I don't think I've complimented enough how amazing the landscape shots are in this film. One of the complaints this movie gets is the cinematography borderlines a B movie. I personally disagree with that. There are quite a bit of clunky moments, but again, this is a story that's supposed to be chaotic, harrowing, and truthfully depressing. Shots like this can really give us a sense of Shuya's crushing emptiness. Hiroki here is pretty different from his original counterpart. He was one who, due to excessive bullying as a child, took up martial arts for self-defense. He's the tallest kid in class, it's supposed to be pretty built. Film Hiroki is pretty average, not really a character that stands out besides for his tragic end, such as many characters here. Shinji, on the other hand, is pretty accurate, even his damn haircut is right. Although the relationship between Shinji, Shuya, and Hiroki is downplayed in the film, they're still pretty evidently close friends. The film does give us some insight on Shinji and his talents, such as being a skilled hacker due to his uncle who was a fighter against the government. Shinji is the cool guy, but not an arrogant one. He is loyal, caring, cunning, but most importantly, cares for his peers. His speech here shows why he's such a reliable person to everyone and inspires the audience to want to follow him. The transition between timelines here is pretty flawless. Given that when we return to the present, the collar is almost out of view, and then we get our close-up, Shaki grabs the collar in a return to reality. It's incredible how one of the most iconic images and memorable moments of the film belong to a scene that only lasts very briefly. Yet, that's the power of this film. We don't get all the in-depth backstory that the book offers, but we can still care about these characters. And one part is because of how well they are portrayed both in script and some of the acting. We learn pretty much all we need about Chikusa and the dialogue with Nida, that deplorable bastard, and her flashback with Hiroki. Why on earth Hiroki wasn't interested in Chikusa? I couldn't tell you. I couldn't. Now, Nida was a bit more of a jock in the novel, not sure if the film gave that impression, which gives him some level of popularity and strength to the rumors of him dating Chikusa. Not only that, but his athleticism did somewhat intimidate her, questioning if she could outrun him. Of course, he ends up pulling a crossbow on her, so it ends up in a fight. All in all, this scene is practically ripped straight out of the book, just condensed. Difference here being that her weapon is a knife instead of an ice pick, and that she full-on attacks Nita. What makes Chigusa so memorable is how strong of a character she is. Her on-screen presence is brief, but left a lasting impression on her viewers. She's definitely more of a fighter than the other students here, but doesn't bear malicious intent. Meanwhile, Nita is more cowardly as he runs away, even though he had the weapon advantage here instead of fighting her like in the book. In the book, she gets shot in the leg, Losing her weapon, she's forced to scratch out Nita's eyeballs with her nails. And then she stomps on his giblets. Well, the film got the same point across, methinks. I can't say much else other than this scene is perfect. One of the rare moments that the film lets us peer into a character's mind. The sunset offers obvious symbolism, one of the oldest in cinema. Chikusa's final words are used to compliment Hiroki, and the last thing she hears is a compliment returned. This death is handled with so much emotional weight that it leaves a heavy feeling as it transitions back to the base. Chikusa's character reminds us that these are not just kids for shock factor, but humans with entire lives and backstories that have led up to this point to be snubbed away. The emotional weight is furthered by a slightly drunken Kawada telling Shuya and the audience his story. Another tragedy to remind us that this is not an isolated event, this is a common one. 
children are constantly put under the same hell multiple times a year just so the government can flex their power. Kaleda shows us that even the survivor of the game isn't a winner. Hell, they aren't even exempt from playing the game again. They get to live, but at what cost? All their friends are dead. Their family is gone. The woman he loves is dead. All that awaits them is nothing. Shadow work here is incredible. There's a lot of Kawada that's still shrouded to us. Is he even telling Shuya and Noriko the truth? Is he using them to win again? Maybe a bit of both. Maybe he is fighting his inner demons on how to handle this. Does he really think that they can escape with their lives? Or does he think this will just be another Keiko situation? After Noriko eases his mind a bit, more of his face illuminates, his cloudiness beginning to clear. Then a split light on his face, usually symbolic of a character hiding something, before leaving the shadow and telling the others his plan. It is funny that they just now shared their names amongst each other. A good bit of the book by this point would have been the three growing closer together. Such as Kaoda and Shuya relating over rock music, openly bringing in Springsteen's Born to Run, a song which heralds major themes of the story. Or, I should say, the message to the children. Kaoda in turn responds with my favorite line from the book, if everyone listened to more rock and roll, we'd be better off. There are plenty of plot lines that have been watered down or neglected. A removed plot line includes Sho, an openly gay character who is killed off quickly by Kiriyama in this movie. His characterization in the novel has been criticized as being a more offensive look at a gay man, but the film definitely could have fixed that with its already damn good job at making elements more realistic and grounded. His story is actually pretty interesting in the book. He witnessed Kiriyama being the villain that he is and decides to beat him for justice. So he follows Kiriyama thinking he's slick, while Kiriyama is in fact fully aware that he's being followed. He tricks Sho into going to a forbidden zone, which results in his collar being detonated. In the book, he is the only student to die by the collar. So, how was the sword more effective than just shooting him in the head? I mean, it's a badass shot though, don't get me wrong, and illustrates how Kiriyama does possess many skills. Say what you will, the fake head looks awesome and the lighting here works so well that it makes it more convincing. This reaction shot used to be my profile picture on Skype. That's how old I am. By the way, the guy who died here, Oda, is a bastard. He hates just about everyone due to his jealousy and is actually the one who kills Hirono in the book. He also attempted to kill Hiroki but was unsuccessful. The lighthouse incident upsets me every time I see it. It, of course, is another instance of tragedy stemming from fear. Yuko, having witnessed the fight between Oki and Shuya, just assumes that the most pacifistic and nice guy in the class is playing the game and tries to poison him, which has negative consequences. Again, fear takes control of the mind of those who succumb to it and fall victim to tragedy and put it onto others. Not only that, but it also opens a whole can of worms that show the distrust between all these girls who spent so much time prior working together and trying not to play the game. Fukasaka shows that even their teamwork couldn't survive the program, an irony being that the one who actually killed everybody survives the incident, but her guilt takes over and she kills herself. Shuya's reaction is warranted here. Ah yes, Nodiko's dream or memory. We have a few angles to look at this, the dream that shows Noriko and Kitano eating ice cream and walking together on a riverbank. Keep in mind that Noriko is the only student that cared for Kitano and has not looked at him with the same disgust as others, just saw him as lonely. As sweet as this dream is, it's also incredibly lonely. We can infer that Noriko isn't just the only student who cares about Kitano, but is the only person in the world who cares about Kitano. We know his family doesn't. He is isolated, and Noriko is the only source of remote happiness for him. Kitano opens up to Noriko, asking her if his lessons are boring, which she jokingly confirms. And he doesn't find it humorous, but rather sad, stating that all the students look at him the same. He then gives less than cute remarks that it isn't as easy to discipline kids these days. Even when he got stabbed, he couldn't get angry. Noriko confesses that she kept the knife that stabbed him, in which Kitano, the teacher, asks the student, what would an adult say in this situation? 
opening a much larger question to the adults watching the film. Noriko's answer is never given to us. This scene shows us again the sympathetic side of Katano and how the adults aren't all one-sided monsters. Immediately after, Katano receives a call from his daughter, and it isn't good. Shuya also reflects on his own father, who seemed to be a victim of the working world, unable to take the pressures, but he was loving to Shuya, his child being the only thing he probably cared about in the world. There's also very odd attempts to make Shuya look younger here. His memories transition from those who loved him, all of them leaving him with the same message. To keep going. This is the best scene in the movie. Ooh. The end game is hitting hard with the emotional weight, and it's about to get worse. Shinji, the most reliable damn character in the book, successfully hacks the government, but Katano, the smartest man in the room, knows the age-old solution. If only Shinji had better aim, this story could have had a happier ending. This event actually did happen, but a lot earlier in the book, but it definitely fits better here to wrap up the film. It also prevents us from having the goofy car chase that would not have matched the tone of the film. This final battle is quite cinematic, even if Kiriyama is pulling a Halloween 2 here. Everything about this is immaculate. The fire in the background, the western style standoff, the intensity is all over the place. Far more interesting than a car chase. It was actually Noriko who shot and killed Kiriyama in the book, but Kawada took the blame to alleviate her guilt. Shuya's speech criticizing the modern adult being untrustworthy cowards, but instead of hating them, he wants to do better, to grow better, to be what he considers a real adult. Even Kitano seems to be thinking about this notion. Kitano seemingly depressed over the death of Noriko sends off the military, meaning he's got some damn power to him, but truthfully, he knew about the scheme and wanted his end to come. He wanted Noriko to be the one to do it. It's definitely a more poetic ending than the revenge angle of the source material. I also love that Katano offers Kawada a beer at the end of the game. Apparently this painting was actually done by Takeshi himself. He is actually a damn good artist. This work is often looked at in the same light as The Final Girl. In horror films, I tend to forget many consider this a horror film, The Final Girl is the famous survivor trope. I'm sure you're all aware of it. I never really looked at it like that, however. I saw it plainly as it was. Kitano wanted Noriko to win. She was his light. The only bit he had in this dark world. Kitano dies, knowing that he has nothing left for him. No one waiting for him. And parts with giving us one of the best lines in all of cinema. <laughs> Kitano's death isn't the last, however, as not even Kawada could survive his wounds. But he made it long enough to set Noriko and Shuya off and leave them with one last bit of advice. Don't chase after revenge. Live a happy life. Don't go for revenge. Noriko and Shuya begin their new lives as criminals with the knife that started it all. The film gives the audience one last message. As same as the novel, but without the copyrighted Springsteen song, Run. So, what was the point of Battle Royale? There's not really one answer to that. It's been debated and written about for decades now. There are obvious themes of youth culture, obedience over individuality, and generational gaps. The last message of the film is from Fukusaku himself, who is telling us to run. But are we running away or running forward? Ultimately, it's a message of freedom. Freedom that we each, every one of us deserve. I don't think the film is meant just for younger generations though, but for the older too. That's why Kintano is such a compelling character. Just as Shuya tells the audience the type of adult he wants to be, the viewers should ask themselves, what type of adult are they? I think most people remember the film for its violence and shock factor, but really, that wasn't the highlight for me. It never was. It was the students and the world they lived in. The warning that they gave us. It gives critiques on Japan's social issues, from delinquency to intense work world, to the growing suicide rates resulting from that, and seeing their government as inept. All of which can hopefully be fixed by the future generations. One could hope. 
Battle Royale has left a major legacy. Before getting into that, I would like to talk about the cast as I said I would. The film started a lot of careers, many of which are my favorite actors. Shuya was played by Tatsuya Fujiwara, a very, very popular face throughout the 2000s. He may also be known in the West for portraying Light Yagami in the only Death Note movies that matter. He's been in other anime adaptations as well, such as Kenshin and Kaiji, as well as being in so many films and games. Kawada was played by Taro Yamamoto, who has since retired from acting to go into politics. That's actually kind of crazy given this film. He also played in Kaiji alongside Fujiwara once again. And those two are just a delight together. Shiaki Kuriyama played Chigusa. And, well, she's Shiaki Kuriyama. Her filmography is pretty vast, but interestingly, even before Battle Royale, she played in another famous Japanese franchise, Juon. The original. Not the theatrical film. The original. As many of you know her, Gogo from Kill Bill. Koshi Basaki played Mitsuko. I remember her most fondly from my favorite J-drama, Orange Days, where she was phenomenal in it and also spoke exclusively through sign language. She also played in the horror series One Missed Call, among also having a crazy vast filmography. It's worth noting that this was a first major role for many of these actors, and you can definitely see how their skills have grown over the years. Kiriyama's actor, Masanobu Ando, is still acting today. He was also in the Kenshin series, as well as being in the new live-action City Hunter that comes out this year. Here's hoping that one will be good. Shinji's actor, Takashi Tsukamoto, was in a lot of stuff too, but I'll always remember him as that random guy who got killed in GMK. As if Gogo wasn't evident enough, Tarantino loves this movie, stating it as his favorite movie in the last couple decades. Koshi Pisaki was also supposed to be in Kill Bill, but unfortunately couldn't make it due to her schedule. Shaun of the Dead also references Battle Royale, with the poster and Shaun's end appearance looking pretty similar to Kawada, doesn't it? Countless movie sites and critics have praised this film since its release, once they got over certain mindsets, and America was even planning a remake. It never landed and constantly ended up in development hell. Probably for the better. One of the main reasons it never landed was because of Hunger Games. I'm not gonna lean one way or the other here, I'm just speaking factually. There are a lot of similarities between these stories. The author of Hunger Games, Suzanne Collins, who had not written the book until 2008, claims that she had never heard of Battle Royale. I guess they were living in a rock during that time. Regardless, the stories are similar and certain producers fear that making a Battle Royale film now would make weird waves with the Hunger Games fans fearing that the younger generation would think that Battle Royale would be the ripoff. Google exists, but they have a point. It would be insane to not acknowledge the major impact that this film left. It could be one of the most influential films in the past 20 years. Many films have referenced it, and many have been accused of being bad knockoffs. The most famous series influenced by Battle Royale recently was Squid Game. Truthfully, I avoided the series because I thought it was a kaiji ripoff mixed with Liar Game. But hey, it was a pretty popular series at release, and we have Battle Royale to thank for that. Battle Royale has since become a popularized genre seen in film anime and video games. I wonder if the younger generation are aware of this film, or the impact it left behind, giving them these media that they enjoy now. I really do think it's a masterpiece, one that should never be forgotten, but one that should be immortalized. The novel's great too, and if you actually enjoy reading, I'd recommend it. I think that they make good companions when looking at them together. How did you feel about this film when you first saw it? Did you enjoy it, or did you see it as nothing more than senseless violence on screen? Let me know in the comments below. As always, thanks for watching. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you haven't, as it really helps the channel out a lot. And as always, I'll see you next time.